Hi, I'm Caroline, a yoga teacher with a special interest in menopause based in Edinburgh. And hello, I'm Dr Claire, a GP with a special interest in menopause based in North London. Together with the Menopause Sisters and we are here to guide and support you through your menopause journey. Welcome Dr Ella, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, Dr Ella is an integrative medical doctor and a leading voice in the field of mind and body medicine. She has dedicated her career to using breathing as medicine and as a tool for personal growth. Ella is a sought after speaker both locally and internationally and has a revolutionary way of facilitating groups with a profound transformation. She is the founder of Breathwork Africa and author of Breathe, Strategizing Energy in the Age of Burnout. She lives and works in Johannesburg, South Africa, and we are so delighted and pleased that you could join us this morning to talk about breathing, which Carolyn and I have wanted to focus on, particularly around the perimenopause and menopause for some time, um, and particularly in relation to Caroline's work with yoga and yoga in the menopause. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you, Carolyn. So wonderful to be talking with you this morning. So I started off my career as a medical doctor. I trained at the University of Vatersrand in Johannesburg, And when I started off as a medical student, I had a vision of studying obstetrics and gynecology or perhaps pediatrics. You know, I had this whole career plan mapped out. And I found that after my internship and community service, I was emotionally burnt out. I couldn't even imagine spending another month you know, in a public health care system because I was sleep deprived, I was exhausted, and I just felt like I needed a break. So I took the opportunity of locoming for a friend's uh, GP practice, and I really loved it. I really enjoyed the dynamic of uh, the working with family systems, and I subsequently bought the practice and really built up a family practice in in that community. And what I really enjoyed was having the opportunity to spend more time with my patients and really listening to what was showing up physically, but also what they were dealing with emotionally. And what became very apparent to me, there's certain people that were showing up with very similar symptoms. And I started to make the connection between what people were showing up with physically and what was going on emotionally. There was a very definite connection, became more and more clear. The patterns became clear that certain emotional issues would show up with certain symptoms. But I felt ill-equipped to understand the scientific basis of this connection and also ill-equipped to support sustainable wellness I found that uh, the training of medical school was really geared towards symptoms without really understanding the full big picture and then putting the tools in place that empowered patients to support sustainable wellness. And so I kind of went through a dark night of the soul, you know, and uh, realized that this formula that I was living personally and professionally wasn't quite serving me. And so I went on a whole journey uh, to teach myself basic principles of nutrition. And at that time, I was also in the personal process and doing deep yoga practices and, um, you know, kind of creating all of these links between Ayurveda and Chinese medicine and nutrition and anatomy and physiology. It was kind of all starting to come together. And I studied a system called Body Talk. And very soon, it opened a whole new way of being, and I couldn't be in that practice anymore. So I sold my GP practice and moved a little out of Joburg to a beautiful wellness center at the banks of the Crocodile River in the cradle of humankind with um, my best friend, Marisa, who was running a wellness center at the time at a family's home, and she had a social work background. And together, we started to craft these programs that integrated yoga and massage, energy work and nutrition. And we started to craft these 12 week journeys for people. And it was incredible to see the transformation and realize that actually there's very little that we have to do to support sustainable wellness, that our role and responsibility of doctor and patient is to co-create 
a environment that supports the body's natural ability to heal itself. It's been fascinating, uh, you know, being the witness to healing and transformation journeys to see how these principles unfold and that they are the principles of nature. Mm -hmm. And perhaps in understanding what those principles are and aligning to them, you know, it really uh, it changes the way that we relate to our health. And so uh, about 10 years ago, uh, as part of this journey, when I was at a wellness center, a uh, breathwork uh, master arrived and he was from the States, Dan Brule, and he was facilitating a series of workshops. And I was curious and attended his talk and had a session. And I have to say, it completely blew my mind. Of course, I had been practicing conscious breathing as part of my yoga practice, but this particular um, technique was uh, life altering because it kind of gave me a direct experience of myself. Since then, I have been living from the breath and with the breath. And what really excited me about this idea of using conscious breathing, well, it, rather it makes integrative medicine more accessible to more people. So often when we talk about integrative medicine, uh, you know, it involves running a series of ex expensive blood tests, for example, and then, you know, um, using expensive supplements, for example. It, it can be quite an expensive and here I found, or I started to experience for myself, how conscious breathing is a potent medicine that is always with us. Mm -hmm. We're always breathing. And when we learn to use it more consciously and skillfully, we are creating that environment. We mm -hmm. are supporting that environment that aligns with the natural laws that supports the body's ability to heal itself. And so this is what I've been working with for the past 10 years, is to think about how to simplify the field of conscious breath work to make it more accessible to more people. And especially living in the South African context and working in the South African context where so many people are so under-resourced, you know, here is an accessible tool that is available, that is free, that is easy to learn and easy to teach. And so we have created an organizational organization called Breathwork Africa. And uh, we share the art and science of conscious breathing with as many people as we can. We also train practitioners so that we are able to reach more people. And uh, yeah, so we're really excited about that. And so that's where my focus is. Uh, my practice now as an integrative doctor is is based on breath work as the primary tool. And uh, I'm also involved in, in, in growing Breathwork Africa. It makes you wonder, when we talk about integrative medicine, like you say, we think about other investigations, we think about involving other health professionals, but actually in this co-creating health environment and in sort of trying to think about a patient or a client a bit more holistically this is so vital isn't it particularly well particularly in the pandemic when when our stress levels are really high and our cortisol levels are really high but also just trying to manage our health in more ways than is just let's go to the doctor let's get a blood test let's take some medicine it's interesting Claire that um, in this time of the pandemic there's been a shift of people thinking about how to support their own health and how to understand the inner workings of their physical body. You know, people have been going to healthcare facilities less, of mm. course, unless they have, you know, severe symptoms. And so in a way, it's been, it's been a good thing, mm. you know, and I, I'm really grateful for platforms like this mm. that uh, support people to understand the inner workings of their physical body and to feel empowered with tools. I think you're absolutely right, Ella. I think health and well-being, people have decided to investigate a little bit more and actually go, how can I help myself? And it's been a really interesting journey for many people. And I often describe the breath as our, you know, our tool, as you mentioned. It's the one thing we have with us. It's the one thing we can learn to control and have this wonderful tool to help our health and well-being. 
But um, I sometimes also describe it as a way to hack into different body systems because actually once we learn to control the breath, it's like a little hack. <laughs> you know, we can really help our hormones. We can really help our cardiovascular system. We can, there's, you know, there's so much else that is governed by our breath. And, uh, you know, when we start to understand how this happens, wow, you know, it, we wake up to the miracle that is this human system. And, uh, you know, we often think about breathing as a simple function, function of um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, you know, sending oxygen to cells and, you know, the carbon dioxide being released. And yet it is so much more than that. So the, the breath is part of the body's autonomic nervous system function. And as a result, it well, as such, it is responsible for maintaining homeostasis in the body. So it's a central aspect of the body's way of maintaining a sense of balance and homeostasis and is linked to uh, pH. It is linked to body temperature just on the autonomic nervous system uh, level. But if we also look a little bit deeper at how breath starts, breath begins when the diaphragm, which is the main breathing muscle, contracts and flattens. And just the the flattening, the contraction and relaxation of the diaphragm already is accessing so many other body functions. So when we look at the diaphragm, we see that it is the central connector of the body's fascial system, the connective tissue. Mm -hmm. And when we work with the diaphragm, we are accessing every single other part of the body through the fascia, right? We are able to access even the the muscles in the little toe as the diaphragm moves the fascial web moves mm. you know and i've been working with a uh, someone who was uh, who had a spinal injury and is now paraplegic and uh, he well when he had this injury and was in icu it was um it was obviously quite devastating for him and by some miracle He's, he was able to maintain the function of his diaphragm. So the fibers that innovated his diaphragm were still intact. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's how he kept himself alive, by, by consciously breathing. You know, that's, that's what he had to do. And now he comes to me 20 years later, and he's working through some other, some other issues and was really interested in breathing. And just by, by me showing him how the diaphragm moves and how he's able to access and influence his toes and his feet that he can't necessarily feel, just that visual was so mind-blowing and empowering for him, you know. So that's just one example of how just the movement of the diaphragm can influence the whole part of the body. It's also related to our lymphatic system, you know. Uh, it, it is obviously so uh, connected to the body's autonomic nervous system. As you said, it's a way to hack into. Mm-hmm. So when we understand the role of the inhale as the activator of the body's sympathetic nervous system, of the exhale as the activator of the parasympathetic nervous system, then we can understand when we're slowing down and expanding the inhale, we are consciously working with the body's energy system. When we slow down the exhalation, when we breathe through the nose, when we lengthen it, we're activating the parasympathetic nervous system. It becomes really quite exciting. I'm just excited hearing uh, a doctor as well talk about it in this way, because actually this idea of integrative medicine or, and breathing, it's, it's still quite new, I feel. You know, I still, I feel, still feel it's one of these things that still people are not sure about it necessarily. And from a medical perspective, it, it, it's still, you know, medicine is still catching up with this, maybe this side of kind of nutrition, breathing, yoga, somatics, movement, and how that can really help help the body. For the listeners who are not familiar with maybe what the diaphragm is um i sometimes describe it as a looking a bit like a jellyfish and i'm not sure if you've <laughs> if you've used that term as well it's, it's yes. at the bottom of the rib cage um and it's it's a a muscle that it's a an, it's a muscle that just works with our breath doesn't it i mean it's the best way maybe to describe it we don't have to it's not like when you run and you're physically using your muscles in movement it just naturally works with the breath 
So we can think of, of it as a jellyfish shape or parachute shape. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a flat kind of structure. It's, it's dome shaped and three dimensional. And what's fascinating about the diaphragm is that it's uh, attached to the lumbar spine, right? It's attached to the, the inner part of the rib cage, right? Uh, from a skeletal perspective, but it's also attached through connective tissue fibers to the pericardium around the heart. Okay. So the tissue that surrounds the heart. And it's also connected to the lining of the lungs. Right. So every time we, well, the inhalation actually begins when the diaphragm contracts and, and it allows air to flow in. That's what the inhale is. And when the, when we exhale, the diaphragm moves back to its dome shape. So if we put our hand on the belly, and we feel this gentle rising and falling of the belly, what we're actually feeling on the inhale is the diaphragm flattening and gently pushing the contents of the abdomen out as the lungs inflate. And the exhalation is when the diaphragm moves back to its dome shape, and that's an exhalation. Now, that movement in itself is massaging the abdominal organs with every breath. Okay, it's massaging the heart with every breath, right? It's beautiful if you think about it. Okay, so the the liver uh, uh, on the right side and the and the spleen on the left side. So if you think about those two solid organs, uh, they're getting massaged with every breath. Okay, uh, if we think about uh, the um, the intestines are being massaged with every breath. So it's really important that the diaphragm is flexible and open and free. And when we, we sit for, for prolonged periods uh, at our desk, for example, and it's just the nature of our modern lives, it makes the diaphragm weaker. And we tend to then breathe with the muscles of the neck and the shoulders. And this then leads to a whole other a series of symptoms, headaches and shoulder pain and, you know, neck pain and insomnia and a whole host of symptoms. So it sets up a vicious cycle. The diaphragm gets weaker. We are not optimizing that, that kind of pulsating movement. And we are not getting the best from our breath, which is really massaging the abdominal organs, massaging the heart. And we can then uh, imagine the ripple effect of that, mm. you know. So uh, the lymphatic system, which is part of the body's detoxification uh, process, is not being optimized. Kind of toxins build up in between the cells. And, and so, you know, that's just one example of how our dysfunctional breathing habits can lead to a host of other symptoms that we might not necessarily connect with the breath at all. And it is really, I believe, the most underrated uh, aspect of our health. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> it's just, it's <laughs> lovely to be taught, you know, when we you know when you meet someone, you talk to somebody and they just understand the breath work. Because I spend a lot of time saying the key is the breath in a lot of my classes. And obviously I teach a breathe class as well. And I often do say, you know, taking that breath with the diaphragm actually you are massaging your heart so it was lovely to hear you talk about you know talk about how the diaphragm massage, massages other parts of the body i often talk about yeah bringing some movement to your body to sort of gently stretch out muscles and ligaments so you can actually even create more space for the breath the movements and uh, the body movements that we experience in yoga and other movement practices are really there to serve the body to open up as you said to make space for breath is all to serve breath so that the life force can flow through the body and arrive and be absorbed by every cell of the body. We're going to take a break there and listen to some messages from our sponsors. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. Radio. 
the station that makes you feel good. Oh no, I was just going to say, you know, one of my one of my questions being um, sort of a very Western doctor in terms of medicine, um, but trying to incorporate more holistic methods in our care and I think we are getting better at it like you say but I think we've got a long way to go and particularly in in treating um treating treating people um as a whole and not just treating their condition or their symptom like you mentioned Ella and it's it's really about breath work being fundamental I guess to health and you've mentioned it there really well in terms of how we can get quite quite stressed quite tight sitting at our desks we're doing that a lot more but are there other ways that um because I know that you've started um a, a breath intelligence class or that that's some of your focus with with one of your partners and I just wondered if that's something that we could mention and discuss um as to how it might help as well yeah thank you Claire thank you for that question yeah so you know when we talk about breath work we understand that breath is part of the body's autonomic nervous system Mm -hmm. and we don't have to think about it the body's doing it like the heart beats our breath is breathing us all the time but that automatic breath that uh, autonomic nervous system function is is a language and it is reflective of Every thought that we have, every emotion that we feel, and every posture that we hold has a corresponding breathing pattern. Mm. So if we are experiencing constant stress or we we have a habitual posture or there was a traumatic event or whatever that was, our breath can become locked in that particular pattern. And that particular pattern or suboptimal way of breathing can become our default setting. And that default setting then feeds the vicious cycle of stress and anxiety. So for example, we can be feeling and experiencing stress and anxiety simply because we have been locked into a certain pattern of breathing. So there might not be any uh, conscious uh, trigger for the stress or anxiety, and yet we're feeling it, and we can't make sense of why we're feeling it. Mm-hmm. But it's to understand that those practices and techniques, whatever they may be, because each of them have their particular role, they're all to serve, ultimately, our breath intelligence. And breath intelligence is our natural breath that is there to serve optimum health in every aspect of our life so that our baseline breath is able to nourish and support every single cell and the functioning of the whole body and the communication system in the whole body. And that natural breath has certain qualities. Okay. It's a breath that is free, that is flexible, Mm -hmm. that uses diaphragmatic breathing or that is driven by diaphragmatic breathing. It is a breath pattern that supports every activity that you are doing. For example, if you are sitting and um, in a meeting and you're focusing and concentrating, that your breath is still supportive, that you're not holding your breath as a reaction to paying attention. Mm -hmm. That, you know, when you are scrolling on your phone, And when we are opening up an email, we're not holding the breath, okay, because what's happening to our brain function, our chemistry. So that is a reactive breath that is not necessarily supporting the activity that we're doing. How can we use our breath to power our voice when we are having a conversation, when we are doing a presentation? Where are we speaking from? So breath intelligence, they are parameters of yeah, well, we've, we've spoken about the 10 parameters of breath intelligence that are little guidelines that support us to just feel into how we are progressing with our breath practice and perhaps what to become aware of. Mm-hmm. And that all the techniques support ultimately our breath intelligence. 
It, it's so fascinating, isn't it, Caroline? Because I think that this is really, um, it, it could really help. And we talk, obviously talk a lot about hormone uh, hormones and the perimenopause and the menopause and how a lot of our symptoms can be eased with not not only just yoga and, and yoga techniques, but also thinking about how breathing can potentially help symptoms of hot flushes and anxiety. Um, and I wonder if there are any particular techniques that you can think of Anna, that, that would help perhaps for a woman who's struggling with symptoms of the perimenopause whatever those symptoms might be when we speak about the foundation of any breath practice okay. it's breath awareness so before we start to engage the breath in any particular way or uh, change it in any way the foundation of any breath practice is simply learning to familiarize yourself with the nuances of breath and to experience what breath feels like in your body. So to feel what it feels like in your nostrils at the cooler air uh, on the inhale, uh, you know, then the warmth of that breath in, in, on the exhale, the rise and fall of the belly. So what that does is wakes up our ability to, well, rather it's, it increases our interoception, Mm -hmm. right? And interoception is the ability to feel into the information that is being sent from the body to the brain. And we have all of these senses that constantly send information from the body to the brain and especially via the vagus nerve, right? And so breath awareness helps us to uh, deepen our uh, awareness of these signals, Okay, so that's the first place to start is simple breath awareness, not changing the breath in any particular way, simply watching the breath and getting curious. How fast am I breathing? How slowly am I breathing? Where's my body holding tension? Where does it feel soft? You know, where am I unconsciously holding tension? Where does my body feel warm? What is the warm spots? What are the cool spots? Right. And, and so breath awareness is incredibly powerful. The other practice that I feel is incredibly helpful is what we call balanced breathing or cadence breathing. And that is simply equalizing the inhale and exhale through the nose. And there's a particular ratio that seems to be uh, most beneficial to balance the body's autonomic nervous system. And that's between five and six breaths a minute. Okay, just depending on what feels comfortable for you. So that's essentially inhaling slowly through the nose for a count of five or six, and then exhaling slowly through the nose for a count of five or six. Right. And the important thing to remember that when we are doing these practices, that it feels as if the breath begins at the center. So often when we start to do uh, breathing practices and we are trying to deepen the breath, we kind of do this. It's almost like a sniffing Mm -hmm. and, and, and using tension in the neck and the shoulders to draw in that breath. That's what I often see people doing. And so if we can just shift that awareness and feel that we begin the breath from our still point, from the core, and we are making space from the center. And that making space is an invitation to breath, for breath to flow in. Then it becomes effortless. Mm. So if we can just feel that expansion of the ribcage from side to side slowly, the inhale naturally flows in. And there's a softening of the neck and the shoulders it completely changes the way we do that. So very important then when we are doing the practice of cadence breathing or balanced breathing on the inhale, rather than trying to force the breath in, we're inviting breath from the center. And then on the exhale, we feel the whole body is calming down and softening. And for this practice, there are no pauses between the inhale and exhale. Um, You know, it's not wrong to do the pause, but for this particular practice, we are just letting the inhale flow into the exhale like that. And if we do this even for five minutes, uh, it has a great impact. It's a very soft, subtle technique, isn't it? I often describe it as a, I sometimes describe that wonderful balanced breathing as 
um, if you can imagine you've got a feather in front of you and it's not really moving, you know, it's just floating in front of your nose and trying to keep a sense of softness and ease around the breath, Beautiful. which for yes. many people is really, you know, it's very difficult because actually, you know, from quite a young age, if you think about children at school, you know, hunched over desks, suddenly they're in that, that position where the lungs are restricted. And so for many people and for many women, it's almost like they're having to relearn how to breathe, how to to relearn how to efficiently use the diaphragm and take that slightly lower, softer, subtle breath that, that we're discussing, actually, Ella. Um, and I've got a question around, you know, everyone you work with is, it, does, how long on average does it take somebody to, but to really begin to connect and focus on that slightly softer, deeper breath? Yeah, I think that's so uh, dependent on, you know, uh, uh, habitual tension patterns, if there's a previous injury, um, you, know, you know, I think that when we support the experience of becoming aware of the breath, the body knows it. It's so natural. It remembers. But as you're saying, we have to relearn. And it's like learning any new skill. You know, it requires consistent practice. It's like learning a new language or going to a piano lesson, except that this is so natural to the body. It knows it. It wants it. It responds to it but it does require a daily practice, you know, so it helps to have a teacher or a guide just as a support and to become aware and to notice any uh, patterns that you need to be aware of uh, for your particular body type and, uh, you know, your particular constitution, but we, we cannot get away from a daily practice. And so the more we practice, you know, the more we can create those neural pathways that support breath intelligence so that our breath can support our natural state of wholeness that is um, part of all of us. Mm. I often say as we consciously breathe, whether it's in a yoga practice or you take those five minutes to breathe during your day, then you can no, your body begins to understand what you're creating in your body, you know, in those conscious breathing moments. And that translates to your unconscious breathing eventually. You know, your body, you were talking about that relearning. And I often, I often recommend to uh, clients that actually you put a few stickers in your house or flat, or you put a post-it note up in a couple of places so that when you see that post-it note, whatever time of day it is, you stop and that's your breathing, your breathing trigger you know you're right I've got to stop here and I've got to breathe for just five minutes um, and become aware of your breath and as you were saying the you know the movement the interoception perhaps the, the feeling of the cooler air as you breathe in or the kind of the texture of the breath um, and actually just finding those points in your day where you can come to a conscious breathing practice um, it's making time isn't it Ella? You know, I often uh, work with people who um, are really committed to their wellness journey and have a checklist. Okay, I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to have my hot water and lemon and you know, do my yoga practice and, you know, a journal. And it's this, this checklist. Mm. And, and then I'm going to do my breathing. And I often say to people, you know, your breath is always with you. So rather than thinking of it as a separate thing to do, Get into the habit of simply turning to it. It's always there. Mm. It is always there. But one of the things I get the most benefit out of with, with the workshops that we run is, is the breath work. Is that mm. few minutes at the start of a class where we can, we can kind of really be mindful of our breathing. So for as a doctor, for a GP, I'm, I'm fully invested in that. But I'm going to ask you a question for, for the many many doctors out there who probably aren't invested how is this going to help what what benefit is it going to give us because I think that there's I mean I I am very aware that this is helpful um, and this helps to calm me down and, and, and just give me that balance that I need but there's going to be a lot of people out there that well how, how does that help me how's that going to you know change anything what would you say what would you say or would, how would you encourage them to give this a go? Well, I think, you know, when something translates from an intellectual conversation mm -hmm. to an actual experience, then that in itself mm -hmm. is the explanation. No explanation is required. Yeah. 
you know, once we actually feel the benefits and we do, you know, yeah. I take people who are sitting in a, in a uh, home in home office, for example, and they're dealing with the incredible stresses of working from home in the middle of a pandemic, two minutes mm. of guiding them to change their breath. It's mind blowing what they're able to feel and experience. Mm. So, you know, I would just encourage you to be open enough yeah. just to experience it. And that, that there is deep science to this practice. This is not something that is just airy fairy or that is just part of something that is a spiritual practice or, uh, you know, part of a particular tradition that this is our birthright. And we are living in times of, of such complexity and we, we tend to seek the most complex solutions for our complex problems and it it can't work that way sometimes the most simple practices the most simple experiences and tools is the very thing that creates a new system so that we are able to relate to the complexity from a different place absolutely i think that's the key i think you've you've just hit the nail on the head you know we often seek answers complicated answers to what could be answered in a much more basic simple way just taking that step back and really reconnecting with ourselves and our bodies and being able to give ourselves the time perhaps to reconnect rather than rushing in and wanting that expensive blood test or that expensive investigation I often I often say the ancient yogis knew that it works. That's why it's been, you know, in the philosophy texts that are so old. And yet now we have the science behind why breathing works and why breathing supports your overall health and well-being. Just coming back to sort of perimenopause and menopause symptoms and talking about that, that word I use, hack, Ella. You know, we know that we can hack our hypothalamus, a part of the brain, through our breath. And that's a, a control centre for... Um, the endocrine system, the hormones, it's a control centre for body temperature. Um, it's a control centre there. That, and this is this is where the oestrogen comes in. It's Dr. Lisa Moscone that says, you know, oestrogen is the conductor of the brain. And once oestrogen begins to fluctuate and drop, the conductor's gone. The orchestra is <laughs> in disarray. It's just not all in sync. And so actually... The breath is one way we can almost gain control back or help alleviate the hot mm. flushes, the anxiety, um, you know, these mm. fluctuating hormones. Um, as part of the body's autonomic nervous system, you know, uh, when we can regulate and maintain balance of our breath, it supports the balance of all the other parameters that are in flux and it feels like a tsunami sometimes, you know. And uh, yeah, as I said, it works two ways. So as the hormones fluctuate, it is reflected in our breath unconsciously. And yet when we consciously train our breath, it can support the the balance and the the smooth waves. It's not to say that the waves are not there, but we can smoothen them out at least. We're going to take another pause there and listen to some messages from our sponsors. <laughs> UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. Welcome back to the Menopause Sisters show on UK Health Radio. We're talking to Dr. Ella Manga today about the importance of breath work. And I was just, um, before that ad break, we were just coming on to particular breathing techniques that, that, you know, might help. Are there any particular, using Caroline's word, hacks that, that we could employ as perimenopausal or menopausal women that might support us um, at this time? Yes. So we've spoken about breath awareness. We've spoken about coherent or cadence or balanced breathing. Uh, one that I love, and I'm sure you do too, Carolyn, is the sitali breath or cooling breath. 
And this was often used in the desert, you know, when there was extreme heat and no water. And it's really wonderful. It's really simple and very effective. And it's simply an, a long inhale, either through a rolled tongue, if that's possible. I know there's a percentage of the population that cannot roll their tongue, in which case we just breathe in through the teeth. So it's a slow inhale, either through a rolled tongue or through the teeth. And when we get to the top of the inhale, we close, seal the lips, and slow exhale through the nose. And when we inhale through the rolled tongue or the teeth, we can feel the coolness mm. of the breath. And we can imagine that we're taking that coolness. And as we're exhaling, we are spreading the coolness to the whole body. And that's uh, very helpful for these hot flashes mm. that we often experience and when we have these temperature fluctuations. So one thing we actually haven't talked about is one of the parameters of breath intelligence. We should be breathing predominantly through the nose in our everyday life. Mm. Okay, so except obviously when we're talking, when, we, when we're eating, when we're yawning, for example. Yeah. And so the nose is designed for us t- to experience the, the cooling, the filtering, the slowing down of breath. There's also release of nitric oxide. You know, when we when we breathe through the nose, which is an important um, vasodilator and antimicrobial and antiviral. So we should be training ourselves to breathe predominantly through the nose. Many of us are not breathing through the nose. You know, mask wearing is not helping the situation. We tend to default to mouth breathing. And mouth breathing is also a pattern of breath that reflects anxiety and stress. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And and so this is becoming part of suboptimal breath. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I encourage uh, an awareness of simply breathing through the nose right, uh, in everyday life. Of course, there are certain practices that involve mouth breathing. I'll come to that in a moment. But that has a particular purpose for the purpose of, of breathing in our everyday life unconsciously that should be through the nose. The other tip is work with your diaphragm, strengthening, opening, and making the diaphragm more flexible, okay? And whether that is doing some form of body work or going to the chiropractor to release patterns of tension in your lower back or whatever that may be for you, uh, work with opening up your diaphragm So we are experiencing the full benefit of optimal breathing. And there are certain practices, breathing practices, that support that too. Mm. There's also something that I'd like to mention um, that I'm I'm seeing a lot that uh, I find maybe helpful to bring up. And that is often when we are feeling anxious and stressed, we want to go to a breathing practice that is going to calm us down. Mm-hmm. And so we, we go to a, a breathing practice that involves a slow exhalation. Sometimes it doesn't always work, right? And, and I'll explain why. When we feel stress and anxiety, there's a release of adrenaline and cortisol into the system. Okay, so... Adrenaline and cortisol is designed to activate energy in the system. So our whole physiology is geared for us to deal with a stressful situation or high demand situation, right? So we have all of these chemicals that have now um, kind of been activated to support a high demand situation. But this is not being expressed, all right? So we, we don't run away physically or we don't, we don't have a way of expressing it or channeling it. So all of this energy gets trapped in the system and creates even more tension in the system. So what I find helpful before we're doing a calming practice is in some way release the tension. Okay, so whether that is through a cathartic breath, like some sighs of relief, <sighs> Just like that, just dumping the the tension out, standing up and shaking out, you know, shaking out the body. So really moving the body, getting it like really shaken up, connect the breath and this body movement 
And then followed by that, you can do a calming practice. You'll get far more benefit from the calming practice Mm -hmm. than if you just went straight into it. So come to your body and start to move your body a little first to release that energy before you do a calming practice. I'm really glad you've brought up the sort of shaking and movement, Ella, actually, because in nature, when you see an animal that's maybe been hunted, and I I sometimes just use a household cat (laughs) as an example, catching a mouse and then letting it go and the mouse freezes. But if that cat walks off, often the mouse will then shake. And that's the natural movement of the animal of the mouse releasing the adrenaline and the cortisol so you know that's that shake it's like that dumping of that energy and then it goes on with its day or its life but actually as humans we've kind of lost that you know and actually yeah. so we hold it in our body we store it in our body and we don't often release so claire was talking about running and i know when she said a big stressful day actually for her a run is a you know she's able to release that stress of the day um and that really helps. But actually for lots of people, there's that holding of the breath, it's the holding of stress, stress and tension um, in the body. And actually, like, as you say, until you can soften and move and release, there's often not a way to immediately come to the breath. So we were gonna just briefly ask you, um, Dr. Ella, if you could give us some top tips really any, any sort of three or four top tips that you would recommend? So if you're curious, if you're interested, I suggest you start off by reading James Nestor's book, Breath. It is a fascinating exploration of the science of breathing. It is so interesting. It's an easy read. I couldn't put it down, actually. Uh, and definitely one of the best books on breathing that I have ever come across. Um, if you're interested in specific techniques, uh, then I also recommend the book Just Breathe by my teacher, Dan Brule. And actually, Dan and I have just released an app now uh, called Breath Tech, which is fantastic. It goes through the cornerstones of breathing. And if you're interested in a particular path, whether that's health or sports performance or spirituality, you can choose your path. And then uh, there's a text, there's a video from Dan, and there's a recorded audio that you can do with my voice. So I'm really excited about that. That's just been launched. And uh, yes, so Breathwork Africa is the organization that I am part of. We offer uh, live sessions uh, for people. We also have recorded sessions on offer. We have masterclasses. I'm actually doing one today where we hone in on a particular topic, for example, the diaphragm or the fascia or the larynx. We hone in on a particular aspect and we really explore that and we offer an actual experience of that. Um, yeah, if we go on to breathworkafrica.co.za, you can have access to all those resources and then I encourage you to look at the BQ system that was created by my colleague and sister, Viola Edward. Uh, she's an amazing breathwork practitioner based in Cyprus. And um, the two of us developed this, the BQ system together. I also encourage you to look at the work of Patrick McEwen. Okay, if, we, if you're interested in functional breathing, and uh, the science of breath, his work is fascinating. And his latest book, The Breathing Cure, is also a wonderful resource. And he's got a whole section on breathing for menopause, actually, and uh, PMS specifically honing in on breathing for women, which is such a uh, field of breath that is not spoken about mm. because of so much research that has been done with men and, you know, breath for peak performance and, you know, looking at that aspect of breath or breathing just for spirituality and really speaks about the science and and the research that has been done in relation to breathing uh, for women and the impact of our hormones on our breathing and what we can do about it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Ella. Really, really fascinating and just so interesting. I will be I will be delving into some of those resources and that app as well and recommending that. Thank you, Claire.